Part 1, A Biblical Mandate for Justice Chapter 1, Cleaning Our Own House A Look at Some Bad Doctrine Behavior is a product of doctrine. Consider the devout Hindu who walks around with cow dung in his hair, or who carefully picks the nits from his child's head to avoid killing them. The nits. He believes that all life is sacred, and all is part of the divine one. His doctrine of reincarnation tells him that the nit might be grandma coming around again. Or how about the Mormon preoccupation with genealogy? He discovers the identity of his dead relatives so that he might perform proxy baptism on their behalf. He is acting upon a fanciful interpretation of Paul's allusion to such baptism, 1 Corinthians 15.29. Finally, take the famous example of the Jehovah's Witnesses who deny themselves blood transfusions, a doctrine built upon the text, the life is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11, has driven them to this practice. Christians also do some strange things when their doctrine is out of line. For example, the false doctrine of racial separation yields the KKK, or a doctrine of love and charity which neglects a doctrine of private property and stewardship yields the blunder the heresy, in fact, of communism. Among Christians in the pro-life movement, there are doctrines in need of examination. One explanation for our lack of success in overcoming the Holocaust, apart from lack of zeal, is lack of knowledge. We are in need of sound doctrine. Critical self-evaluation may put us in a better frame of mind to examine the ethics of the use of force. We present five examples of false doctrine which have infected the thinking of Christians in active opposition to abortion. These characterizations are guaranteed to offend some. But we ask you to indulge us and continue reading. Our hope is that the reader, upon consideration of these errors, will continue to keep his mind open to a seldom taught but historic Christian doctrine of godly force. Faithfulness or Obedience First, we consider the perception we have of faithfulness. There is a familiar desk plaque that says, God has not called me to be successful. He has called me to be faithful. Indeed, but faithful to what? Is it to task which we have chosen, or is it to one that our Lord has chosen for us? There is sometimes a difference between being faithful and being obedient. That is, one can be faithful in carrying out what one thinks to be the will of God, all the while suffering from a delusion or misinformation concerning his will. Kurt Beseda, an abortuary demolitionist put behind bars since the fall of 1984, and I were discussing tactics of rescuing the preborn one day. He said of sit-ins, That is a nice thing to do for puppies. Yes, and it is also a fine thing to do to gain the right to eat at lunch counters as in the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. But is it a sufficient response to child slaughter? Abortuary blockades have been a good thing, but it might be argued that if God was calling some of his people to forceful and effective rescues, those blockaders were being faithful not to God, but to their own surmise of his will. Far be it from us to judge the matter as it pertains to the call of God upon the individual. We just raise the question bearing in mind the distinction between faithfulness and obedience. The blockade served well the purpose of calling the community to come to the rescue of a neighbor. Many have been faithful to the good deed of blocking abortion clinic doors, but the blockade is not necessarily the noblest or highest method of obedience. On the eve of his anticipated death, St. Paul wrote with confidence, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, 7. He may well have said confidently, pardon me, he may well have confidently expected to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, 23. And yet in the same biblical text, there is a caution given against such confidence. There is a clear warning to all Christians concerning judgment day. The words of Christ to those who fall short in their duty will be, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Matthew 25, 46.
It is a warning against dereliction, ignorance, and false confidence. There is a duty which Christians have to the brethren, and there is a duty which Christians have to a neighbor, defined particularly in Scripture as a person in great need. While it will be argued by some that Christ's words in Matthew 25:46 are intended to show accountability toward fellow believers in Christ, thus they argue the judgment for failing to render service to the least of these may not literally apply to the unsaved, question mark, unborn, it is clear that life-saving service is required beyond the family of believers to any helpless and innocent person besieged. Luke 10, 25-37 On the verge of death, Paul was somehow confident. This is the same Paul who spoke of buffeting his body, disciplining himself, lest possibly, after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9.27 Apparently there is a confidence which can be achieved, and perhaps it is one which ebbs and flows, but it is to be achieved cautiously and not without self-examination and examination of doctrine. There is a certain sense of faithfulness that we feel after intervening and blocking access to an abortuary. It may be legitimate, it may not be, depending on the divine call upon one's life. But might there not be a false sense of faithfulness when means were available to act to a greater extent on behalf of the innocent? Quote, to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, measures the degree of shortfall in our faithfulness. If God has said, move this mountain, and we use a shovel instead of bulldozers, have we been faithful? We are cautioned against false assurance that we have been faithful. We are cautioned against mesmerizing ourselves with the popular adage, God doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. It has often been declared that there have been massive protests and nonviolent intervention in 1973. Had there been, rather, had there been massive protests and nonviolent intervention in 1973, there would not be legalized abortion in America today. The absence of a faithful response on the part of the masses of Christians has kept abortion a way of life in America. The abortuaries remain, quote, open by permission of the churches in the neighborhood, chide activists. All true. But it is also possible that given the shortfall in response from the sleeping or apostate churches of the land, a remnant band of faithful might also have terminated the legal practice in the land by mounting a substantial campaign of force. What if the first ten abortuaries built had been set ablaze? What if, after the first abortionist was shot, the pastors of God's churches had sent out news releases saying, Amen? What if Christians individually had simply recognized that a defense was being raised similar to what they would want for their own children? Would a healthy sense of fear have engendered deterrence, if not also a spirit of repentance? Has a false sense of faithfulness on the part of blockaders and others impeded success in abolishing abortion? Were they happy shoveling when they ought to have been bulldozing? And has God been waiting for his people for over two decades to act against the murder of unborn people in the same way that they would respond to the innocent victims if they were born people? These questions are not tactical. If we do A, then B will be the outcome. The point is not to come upon a new methodology in the battle against abortion. Our hope is to do as the Lord directed King Solomon when he covenanted with his people of old, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Be humble, pray, and seek his face. Search out his character and his will in light of what has become a national holocaust. Murderer or victim. A second example of bad doctrine, which has secured a foothold within pro-lifedom, is the victim status bestowed upon aborting or post-abortion women. In this Enlightenment age, in which sin is deemed to be a quaint idea, the flaws in mankind are seen as products of the environment. They are not inherent. Crime is the fault of poverty, or the system. It does not emanate from the sinful soul of man. 
In an effort to deflect attention from the murder of abortion, feminists and leaders of the so-called abortion rights movement built their movement rhetoric around the woman. She had the right to choose. It was her body, her choice. And without, without the avail availability of safe, legal abortion, it was suggested that the only option was to commit an act of self-induced abortion, which could be dangerous and even lethal to the woman. Women's lives were at stake, they shrilled. The baby was eliminated from the picture, and pro-lifers were said to be anti-woman. Never mind that a clear majority of those denouncing abortion were women. Under pressure to respond to accusations that pro-lifers cared only for the baby, the pro-life movement walked into a public relations trap. The victim was no longer the completely innocent child. It was the woman who was being exploited. It was the woman who was being lied to and made an unwitting casualty. It was the woman we were obligated to protect instead of the child. In the wake of this revelation, ministries began to abound with the sole purpose of ministering to women in a crisis. And while that is a noble and right thing to do, the emphasis was on the aborting woman as a victim and not as one who was preparing to or had who had already participated in the death of her own child. Her complicity in the murder of her own offspring was alluded to only obliquely, so as not to offend the sensibilities too greatly. Because of personal health and social pressures upon her, abortion on the part of the woman became more mistake than murder. Biblical truth declares that while our circumstances may exacerbate the problem, the inclination to sin proceeds from our own internal propensities. The temptations which come from without do not encounter neutral ground, nor do they make impressions upon a Lockean tabula rasa, a blank slate. Temptations encounter an original sin nature. So declare the scriptures. James 1, 13-15. So declared the Council of Orange in the 6th century against Pelagius, who denied original sin. But temptations encounter more than a sin nature. For those who seek to modify the woman's role based upon her relationship with Christ, or lack of, Paul argues, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Romans 2, 14 through 15. Even in the unregenerate, there is resistance. The woman who has not come to salvation in Christ has an awareness and an internal prohibition against the act of abortion. Her culpability in the murder of her child does not disappear simply because she is committing the act in an unsaved condition. It is a lopsided view of aborting women which holds them to be more victim than victimizer. The doctrine of sympathy for women who have been exploited by abortion is only partially true. The greedy abortionist seeks to exploit a woman with a crisis pregnancy, but the woman who acts upon the enticement of the solution through abortion sins. Her final decision is oriented around concern for herself. This the Church has consistently proclaimed from earliest times. The Didache and Epistle of Barnabas, early 2nd century, both condemn the sin of abortion. The Didache says quite literally, You shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill them when they are born. There are no statements of exculpation proceeding from a condition of victimhood. The earliest council to deal with abortion was the Council of Elvira in AD 305 in which the gravity of the crime was viewed as a combination of adultery and murder, punishable by the gravest penalty. At a council at Ancyra in AD 314, abortion was legally classified somewhere between premeditated murder and adultery. Basil of Caesarea, also writing in the 4th century, in a letter to Amphilochius, says, she who has deliberately destroyed the fetus has to pay the penalty of murder.
and there is not exact inquiry among us as to whether the fetus was formed or unformed. Jerome, in his letter to Eustochium, says, Some, when they learn they are with child through sin, practice abortion by the use of drugs. Frequently they die themselves, and are brought before the rulers of the lower world, guilty of three crimes, suicide, adultery against Christ, and murder of an unborn child. Another 4th century work, a manual of Christian life and behavior, called the Apostolic Constitutions, says, You shall not slay your child by causing abortion, nor kill that child which is begotten. For everything that is shaped and has received a soul from God, if it be slain, shall be avenged as being unjustly destroyed. Let these biblical and historical citations suffice. The point to be made is that the woman is not viewed as a victim, but as a bearer of true guilt, and it should be recalled that her pregnancy, out of wedlock, adultery in that time, was treated with greater abhorrence than it is in post-1960s America. The stress level for the woman in a crisis pregnancy was much higher. Again, Christians have shied away from proclaiming this truth in reaction to the frequent charge that pro-lifers hate women. The imputation of victim status to women was a concession which ostensibly served polemical and political purposes of the movement. And while this tactic may have served to win the ear of some who subsequently converted to pro-lifedom, the truth remained compromised. Women who aborted their children were not duly charged with murder. They were denied, we might say, the biblical grieving process which involves a true confession. A true confession results in true forgiveness and true reconciliation. It is understandable that we Christians are anxious to extend the grace of God to others. We want to share the good and pleasant news of peace with God, but that peace comes with true confession. All women who cooperate in an abortion are guilty of taking a life. It is well argued that not all women who commit abortions are liable to the same degree that other murderers are. The idea of special circumstances which diminish the degree of liability is a biblical idea, Numbers 15, 25-30, which is also expressed in our own civil legal tradition. Mitigating circumstances of confusion and deceit may attenuate the degree of guilt, even as there have always been acknowledged degrees of murder. But the guilt of murder in some degree ought to be proclaimed without apology by those who would declare the truth. Who can tell the damage of this compromise? Would an unequivocal proclamation of the truth, the culpability of the aborting women, have dissuaded some from the contemplated act? Would there have occurred more conversions following an awareness of sin? Contraception or proconception A third false doctrine which many Christians have swallowed is contraception. Without exploring the various situations, we submit the attitude couples have toward that which God unequivocally calls a gift and a blessing to be the issue at hand. Let our consciences be educated concerning the blessing of children and the general command of God to procreate bountifully. Christians are seduced by overpopulation propaganda. Malthusian fears of limits on the Earth's capacity to sustain a growing human population have justified the use of birth control and abortion in the minds of many. Works such as The Ultimate Resource by Julian Simon of the University of Maryland serve to rebut much of the overpopulation rhetoric, but the most crucial response ought to be a very simple one. God rules this planet and has equipped it for his creatures to inhabit. His people are to be fruitful and multiply, and leave the question of space and resources on this earth to the one who made it and gave the command to be fruitful and multiply. The number of people on earth is irrelevant. The Almighty can withhold the sun or the rain so that the earth could not sustain even one man if he were angry enough. Likewise, he can sustain as many as it pleases him to put on this earth, or the sea, or the moon. Wealth and poverty are not only products of human enterprise or sloth, or the quality of the government. They are the consequences of divine judgments and blessings. The job of his creatures is to obey his commands, which include bountiful procreation. 
We acknowledge that many Christians believe that there may be situations, even divine callings, which necessitate contraception. But in our land, a great many Christians contracept for the same reasons that they and the heathen abort, selfish, hedonistic autonomy. There is no willingness to submit to God's direction, to receive his gifts, to be under his rule. We want to control our own lives, and so we are seduced by the false doctrine of choice. And many a pastor, recognizing that the seduced are also the shareholders in his church, incorporated, do not want to offend and lose contributions. So other business is preached. But preaching loses its sting because it is designed not to inject medicinal pain into the heart, but to sedate the investors. Meanwhile, the abortifacient pill is an overlooked device of murder. Capital Punishment, the Image of God, and the Pro-Lifer A fourth false doctrine which has taken root in the minds of Christians is the proposition that to be pro-life, one must be opposed to capital punishment. Somehow we have taken this term, which originally designated someone who is opposed to abortion, and filled it with new meaning. The term is taken to mean that a pro-lifer holds to some absolutist view of human life, or even all life. By this seduction, pro-lifers are admonished to be anti-capital punishment, pacifist, anti-poverty, pro-government welfare, pro-gun control, animal rights supporters, or socialists. Reverend Matt Truella is the pastor of a local church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the founder of Missionaries to the Preborn. He has said, If pro-life means anti-capital punishment, I'm not pro-life. In truth, we must guard the terms we use so that false doctrine does not become their definition. Our view of the sanctity of human life comes from the scriptures which say that man was created in the imago Dei, the image of God. Those same scriptures declare that because man is so celestially endowed, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9, 6. The rejection of capital punishment for murderers in our time betrays a failure to grasp the biblical doctrine of the sanctity of human life. God does not view human life as absolutely inviolable. Human beings who commit capital crimes merit capital punishment. A holy God punishes evildoers with everlasting destruction. He does not hold them in such esteem as to allow them to go unpunished. And those who slay innocent human life so offend him that he mandates the civil authorities with the job of executing capital offenders. One of the jobs of the church is to advocate that government do its divinely ordained duty. By advocating the death penalty for murderers, the church accentuates the gravity of the crime of murder. When the church neglects to articulate the propriety of the death penalty, it fails to testify to the truth. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and I shall not be ashamed, and I shall delight in your commandments, which I love, says the psalmist. Psalms 119, 46 through 47. Psalm 119. 46 to 47. A thorough examination of the subject of capital punishment is beyond the scope of this book. However, it is necessary to digress briefly to examine a particular case, which is frequently adduced by those who would argue that the New Testament abrogates this civil law. I refer particularly to the record of Jesus' confrontation of the woman caught in adultery, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. This popular text is included in the King James Version and the Vulgate, but it is included in modern versions only with notes informing the reader that the passage is absent in the oldest and best manuscripts. Most textual critics declare that those popular and very literary verses, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her, and Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Do not belong in the canon which we call Scripture. It is, they argue, not breathed out by God and not intended by the Holy Spirit to be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16
The salient hermeneutical point to be made here is that no doctrine ought to be based upon unclear or doubtful texts. Opposition to the doctrine of capital punishment must not lean upon this story. It is agreed by textual critics, however, that while this story was not included in John's account, it is historical. It is an event that occurred. Since it is something in the life of Christ that we know happened, we are induced to answer the question it raises, why didn't Jesus call for the death penalty according to the law? Was Jesus rejecting the old covenant ethic? Was he introducing a new system of justice? No. Clearly, the accusers of the woman were miscreants, looking for some means of trapping Jesus. Their patent perversion of justice in an effort to catch Jesus is an ethical problem, in an ethical problem, is manifest in the conspicuous absence of the male offender. According to the law to which these scoundrels appealed, both offenders were to be brought forth for execution. Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22. In their zeal to have Jesus pronounce the death penalty, these rogues call specifically for stoning, whereas the law prescribes stoning not for the case at hand, but for the case of a pair when the woman is, quote, a virgin betrothed unto a husband, Deuteronomy 22, 23. Moreover, the law required two witnesses to convict someone of a capital crime, Deuteronomy 17, 6. The law also warns, do not join the wicked in putting your hand as an unjust witness against anyone. Exodus 23, 1. Jesus cannot be charged with rejecting the Mosaic law concerning capital punishment on the basis of this text. He cleverly avoided being made party to a perversion of justice by calling the alleged witnesses to come forth, cast the first stone, and do justice, if indeed they were not unjust witnesses. Moreover, the mission of Christ as the suffering servant did not at that time include his future role as judge. Luke 12, 13, 14, John chapter 12, verse 47. It was not his mission to adjudicate the matter, but he did call upon those who, whose duty it was, but he did call upon those whose duty it was to administer true justice. Jesus did not reject capital punishment and institute some kind of new justice system. He confirmed the law, as did St. Paul, Romans 3.31, Matthew 5.17. We must defend the continuing propriety of capital punishment along with St. Paul, Romans 13.4. We present three reasons relevant to the issues of this book following here, A through C. A. Our definition of the term pro-life says simply that we oppose the taking of innocent human life, to which group preborn children belong. It does not mean that we oppose the terminating of guilty human life. It is therefore not inconsistent to be pro-life and favor capital punishment. B. As advocates of true justice, we are advocates of biblical justice. That justice commands and prohibits various actions, but there is another aspect of true justice which cannot be ignored. Besides the demands of just law, there are sanctions against violators. Sanctions serve both to instruct and to deter transgressors. The gravity of a crime is expressed in the penalty of the crime the crime draws. Therefore, the advocacy of capital punishment for capital crimes is necessary for both communication of the truth and deterrence of criminal acts. C. Christians advocate justice for the preborn on the basis of biblical principles found mostly in the older scriptures. Those same scriptures which uphold the sanctity of human life call for the execution of capital criminals. As our advocacy is derived from scripture, what scriptures shall we use? Shall only the newer scriptures be applied? What is the continuing relevance of the older scriptures? These questions are asked ever more frequently by Christians as the legal order in our land continues to move further into post-Christian chaos. As we are led into political concerns through an initial concern with justice, the question comes to the fore, by what standard should government rule and administer justice? We have no standard but the revelation given us.
the advocacy of capital punishment accentuates the relevance of God's word in the civil arena. It signals the role of the author of human life in human affairs and government. He who has endowed men with life, liberty, and property also ordained godly government with the authority to take life, liberty, and property. Rulers in this world have awesome divine authority only because the Lord of hosts has given it to them, and he who gave it to them may take it away. Psalms 82, verse 6 and following. Those rulers who possess authority are bidden to rule in accordance with God's law and execute capital offenders in accordance with his standard. Nonviolence, a fruit of the Spirit? Lastly, we come to the fifth example of false doctrine which has infected the church and the anti-abortion movement. Christian activism has been equated with the adjectives peaceful and nonviolent. It may be argued in a given situation that Christians ought to conduct themselves in a peaceful and nonviolent manner, but such behavior is not essential to true Christian piety. In our land, anti-abortion activists have adopted a sit-in strategy of intervention which was inherited not from the scriptures, but from the civil rights movement. The sit-in tactic served well the purposes of exposing racial, racial prejudices in India under the rule of the British and in the United States. Such peaceful opposition won success in countries with a collective Christian conscience. The same level of success may not be forthcoming in a pagan land where the people have had their consciences seared by two decades of legalized child slaughter. And it is arguable that the force option has been thwarted by the creedal status given the principle of nonviolence. Force is not equivalent to violence. Less still is it to be equated with evil. It is amoral. It can be used for good or for evil. The Christian policeman does not live by an absolute co code of peaceful and nonviolent behavior. Neither does the Christian soldier or executioner. And just as it is ethical to use force for good, it is on the other hand immoral to refrain from using force on some occasions. What is our moral judgment of the nonviolent behavior of bystanding citizens in New York City who watched a woman, Kitty Genovese, being stabbed to death over a 45-minute period. Has a pacifist doctrine lulled much of the anti-abortion movement into a peaceful slumber? Where arms might otherwise have been lifted against those who terrorize innocent children, have they remained limp at the sides of those who have resolved to be peaceful and nonviolent? This, they say, is a good Christian witness, even as they read their Bibles about the man of war, the God of Israel, and the whipping of the impious Jews, and property destruction wrought by Jesus in the most passive phase of his external existence, the Lamb coming peacefully to the slaughter for the atonement of the world's sin. Yes, arguably there are times for different tactics, just as there are times for war and times for peace. Moreover, there are different callings for different people, as there are many gifts. But if, indeed, sit-ins are only a tactic, subject to the vagaries of both prudence and imprudence, a time for evaluation is at hand. It may be argued that the earnest promise of nonviolence against abortuaries from the movement activists has served to establish peace for abortion practitioners. Have the baby killers enjoyed a blessing of tranquility granted by their purported opponents? What has been the message from movement rescuers to the would-be clinic closer? Did he put away his baby-saving dynamite because he trusted the errant teaching of a pro-life leader? And what about that father in anguish over the impending death of his child by a selfish mother? Did he hear nothing from the local leader but mindless repetition of that we must be peaceful and nonviolent mantra? Perhaps the mobilization of pro-lifers and the failure to equip them with sound teaching has turned the whole effort into a clinic defense movement. We certainly ought to establish sound theology 
before making rash criticisms about the use of force, lest we condemn the righteous or dissuade them from doing good deeds.